everybody. Welcome to the Marketing Water Cooler Podcast. My name is Jeremy Franchese. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, today, we are talking about communications, marketing, and impact on culture and people. Uh, we're joined by two guests, uh, Julie Livingston, uh, who owns and operates uh, Want Leverage PR, and Aaron Mohidin. Uh, correct me if I pronounced it wrong. I know I just asked you two seconds ago, uh, who handles uh, and leads up people and culture over at the InSprint Group. They've been rapidly growing uh, and really building a brand around the concept of unconsulting. Uh, a different approach to just delivering measurable impact to businesses. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about people and culture today. Um, so Julie, Aaron, thank you guys for, for joining. How's everything? Uh, Aaron, correct me. Did I pronounce your name right, wrong? What do we got? We're so close, Jeremy. It's Mohadeen. Mohadeen. I've been, I've been married mm. for 10 years and I'm still learning how to say it. So Mohadeen. it's not it's not a problem. Uh, I always take pride in a little bit of practice, but we'll, <laughs> get, we'll get by. How are you guys doing? How's everything? We're, we're great. I mean, it's, it's just great to be here to chat with you today, Jeremy. Good, cool. No, and I, I appreciate you jumping in. I mean, look, everybody tuning in, whether your audio, your video, appreciate you hopping in. Um, look, we're, we, our goal in this show is really, really simple. Leave with actionable insights that allow you to, to leave the conversation, whether it's a two second clip or a 60 minute conversation with something that allows you to take action with confidence to create some impact. Um, we're in a state right now where the average millennial is 2.2 times more skeptical of, of, of uh, sales rep claims. They take that same skepticism into the job market. Uh, retention of of of, uh, of our people is is increasingly more complicated, and uh, we're in a little bit of a different world. And uh, one of the things, Julie, you and I were talking about uh, separately, and it's been more topical, is the the conversation of marketing, developing a much closer relationship with HR and talent and recruiting, which uh, I think has been part of the conversation, but I think now it's more top of mind where it's, we can't just put things on job boards and expect to get the best of the best um, or keep the best of the best. And so um, let's take the first couple of minutes, frame up the conversation. You both have really interesting backgrounds that have brought you to the point uh, today. I think it's helpful uh, for listeners and viewers to have context. And then we'll shift into some of the more topical things like how do we build uh, uh, in a distributed world? workforce, how does comms help build culture, um, and things like that. So sounds good. Sounds great. great. All righty, let's roll. So, um, Julie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. Uh, you've been in PR and comms for, for a good while. You've experienced a lot when it comes to the digital transformation uh, and, and going from your typical PR outlet where you're pitching a story to now it's a lot more socially native, right? You're trying to activate individuals in companies, um, not just a, the big brand, if you want to consider it that. And I know on your website, you talk about finding um, companies that, that are uh, underdogs to that extent, right? Where you're, yeah, you're, I mean, you know. I've, I've been doing public relations and marketing marketing for more than 30 years. And I, I specialize in working with under the radar companies and C-suite executives. So those that may not be as well known as they should be. And I help to elevate their thought leadership and their competitive advantage across media platforms, including LinkedIn. Um, I do a lot of work on LinkedIn for C-suite executives. Um, but I'm seeing now more than ever before that uh, I'm partner, I'm being asked to partner more with the human resources department for my, at my clients' companies. I'm curious from that same point, and obviously that's what brings us today because you and Aaron work hand in hand with, with InSprint Group. What's the trigger event? Because there's, there's two types of people that likely are listening. There's the ones that haven't connected the dots saying I should connect marketing and HR and comms and, and people together. And then there's one that are already doing it. And I'm curious what that tipping point is where they go, oh, that's the thing we need to do. Like what happened there? Was it we were trying to level up marketing and, or excuse me, recruitment and acquisition? Or was it you had an idea and, and then it ended up working really well and sustained it? Well, I think the facts, the fact is, is that the great resignation is still happening. I mean, in 2021 alone, um, there was a major exodus of, you know, millions and millions of people voluntarily left their jobs uh, to look for other opportunities. And the things they were looking for, flexibility, working from anywhere, working from home, especially for working parents, um, you know, more, more, fruit, more time, more life, work-life balance. Um, these are things that, and, and the opportunities for learning and growth and development, these things that they were not getting at their company. So the workplace is really in flux. And so companies more than ever before 
need to really promote why their brand, their company is the best place for employees to work for today. Yeah. I, I remember reading an article, this was, uh, I think I, two years ago, maybe. And I, I, it was one of those where it kind of stuck with you for a second. It was talking about his work, a, a place or a state of mind. I think it, No, it was either a place or state of mind or it was a place or an activity. I don't remember what it was exactly. But the, the premise of it was, now that we don't have this specific physical location, it's more of a state of mind and, and uh, how you allocate time and energy and focus. So the way you engage in it's different because it's, let's be honest, it's, we're sitting on our phone 24 seven, work doesn't exactly go away. Um, Aaron, I, I'd love to, to unpack a little bit on your side before we kind of really dig into to the details. You've been in, in talent and people and culture for, it looks like 10, 10, 12, 10, 15 years since you started off at Grant Thornton um, and kind of took your career from there. Um, would love some insight into, you know, kind of that journey, how you got to Inspiro Group. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to share. So you're right. My background is in talent development. I grew up at Grand Thornton. It was a wonderful place to be. Professional services. Um, you know, it's a it's a great. It 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 was a great place to grow up. That led me to um, working in the legal field for a little bit. The great thing about talent development is that everyone everywhere needs it. Right. It, it, it's transferable by industry, and it's beautiful in that regard. Um, so I went over from Grant Thornton. I started working with a law firm. I was there for a few years because of some personal reasons. I, I well, and actually meeting Meg Newhouse, who is the CEO of Inspiring Group. Um, she and I became colleagues, friends. She's a mentor that I will have forever now, whether she likes it or not. Um, and she and I started talking about consulting, and I was like, Oh, should I do it? Should I not? I don't know. It's a big leap to make. When you're, you know, relatively early in your career, I've started a family, um, but the long story short is me, for some personal reasons, I made that jump. Um, the pandemic hit two months later, so I don't know if I would, you know, the timing is always, is always interesting, but it ended up actually working out great. Um, so I did talent development as a consultant for Inspiring Group for about 18 months and then was hired on full-time as the people and culture lead last July. So I'm almost up on a year now um, in my full-time people and culture role. But like you said, Jeremy, I've been doing talent development for about 15 years. Love it. A lot of change in 10, in 10, 12, you know, that there's a lot of movement in the space. Um, yeah. Oh, people? absolutely. One of the things that I'm always fascinated with, and, and one of the things we talk about, we're, you know, SBS, we're small, but we're a growing organization. We're fully distributed. One of the things I talk about, you can read it in the job descriptions we write, which is really pretty forward around, you and I both know this isn't going to be the last place you work, unless there is a massive, like, anom like there is just an anomaly that takes place, right? It's so true. let's just get out and ahead of it. And one of the first things we talk about in our first interview is just, where, where, where have you been? Where are you going? At this point in your career, you probably know work you no longer want to do and work you do want to do more of. Mm -hmm. And my hope is to ex understand where you're going, share where we're going and where we need help, hence the open rec. And if it can be mutually beneficial, then fantastic. And if that's two years, five years, 10 years, whatever it may be, the goal is to figure out, is it a fit? Because talent and, and development is, is this really complicated blend of what does the company need today and tomorrow, comma, what do you want and need today and tomorrow? And they don't always overlap really. So I'm, I'm curious to, to learn a little bit in this conversation of like how, we, how you balance that. Because and, and Aaron, there's that fantastic question that you ask candidates. I hope you'll share that. Oh, 100%. I mean, you're talking about the balance. The, the interesting thing is, Jeremy, is we have had to pivot so much in the last few years in terms of talent. I mean, and listen, I know everybody's pivoting, right? Like the last two years really threw people for a loop and rightfully so. Um, but what people thought they needed and wanted one day, a month later, even two months later, it switches up. And so you really have to be um, on your toes about that. Now, if you're, if you're asking me, okay, what do we need in order to get the right people doing the, the right jobs for us and our group? It, it's got to be a mutually beneficial relationship. And so to your point, Julie, one of the first things that we sit down and talk about during our preliminary conversation with any candidates is, hey, what makes you tick? What are the things that you want to wake up every morning and ensure that you are doing to be personally fulfilled, to be happy, to be excited? Does that look like, you know, the type of work that you're doing? Probably yes. Um, is it important to you to be giving back in some sort of way? Also, like we are hearing that so much, like I just want to do meaning and valuable work. And also does the way that we, um, you know, 
give that to you? Does our environment, does our culture allow for you to fit in um, and to really feel part of a team? Um, and so, yes, work can pivot and, you know, with talent development, your, your focus can be one day, you know, giving, giving deliberate feedback and the next day having difficult conversations, like whatever that looks like, but overall, and for the day to day, when people come to work, they need to be happy. Um, and Julie, to, to your point, the great resignation has really given people, um, the authority and the ability to make that decision for themselves. I, think I want to add one thing on, on that is, you know, and this isn't an original thought. I, I, remember I saw this in a video, I read this somewhere, but it was like, it's the great re resignation, but it's also the never applying. You know, there, there's a lot of people that are now recognizing that they, their skill set and their capacity to learn is the insurance policy against the changing marketplace, right? So like, if they're struggling with something, they can hit YouTube, they can go buy a book or whatever they're reading, they can go build value into themselves as an asset mm -hmm. and go make 60 grand a year freelancing or doing whatever they want to do. And right. it's not to say it's easy, but it's never been more accessible. And so the, maybe they had a bad, you know, it's like, it's like dating. You have one bad experience, one bad relationship. And now it's the whole thing. The whole outlook is a little tough, right? So if you had a bad experience working at a big company, that that's one boss, one team, one company. But if you're maybe 27, 32, and you're like, man, I, I, I gave them so much. I felt like I didn't get anything in return. I'd rather just make 60 work on my own and live wherever and do whatever and be home every day with my kids. And it's now they're never even applying to the job. Right. Um, I'm curious how, how do companies start, right? There's this big balance right now and balance is the wrong word. There's, there's a little bit of a, an obstacle to overcome for organizations that maybe haven't fully acknowledge that, you know what, my people spending time posting on LinkedIn is good use of company time. Um, them being a part of a podcast in the middle of a Thursday, right, to communicate and add value to the conversation. To, yeah. Because let's be honest, if you actually add value and you have a great company and a good culture, then your biggest competitor is obscurity. It's not Google and Amazon. It's not enough people know you. They can't mm -hmm. form an opinion on you. But Oftentimes, people, uh, at the, especially at the executive level, they're so they're so focused on revenue that they're like, we need marketing 100% of it to focus on new leads, in-market demand, building brand, and, and recruiting is like the last thing they're thinking about because they're like, well, we have a recruiting firm. We have a headhunter. We have those people. They focus on their stuff. Recruiting and or marketing focuses here. How do, they, how do those companies that, that haven't clicked, how do they get over that hump to realize that, you know, there's a better way to do it because I fully agree. You know, if, if I could jump in, I, I do want to say that um, what what Aaron and Inspiring Group are doing in in the in, in the interview process and in the in the candidate vetting process is is so strategically right. They are sharing bits and pieces about their culture right at the very first touch point. They're looking at every communications touch point as an opportunity to promote their brand in a very subtle kind of a way. So if I were a job candidate and I was speaking to Aaron on that you know, first uh, call or interview, and she asked me that question that she just shared about you know, what, do you, what, what do you wanna do every day? What makes you happy every day? I mean, that is a pretty profound question to ask a candidate. It shows that you care about their development and growth, that you want them to grow with the company, and that you're, gonna, you're going to assist them in that process. From a communications perspective, you're kind of planting the seed in their, in their mind about what a great place this is. So then they go off, they continue on with their day. And let's say that candidate then has a, a conversation with a friend and the friend says, so what, how was your day? And, and the candidate says, I just had the most amazing job interview. Yeah. And oh. again, that, that could, they start talking about how enlightened the first interview was, you know, how, how it was so different. And that's how, um, that's how people like Aaron and I are working together more and more so that we can, frame and articulate those key brand messages and make sure they're folded in to every conversation at every touch point, because that is going to get out there. And um, through job candidates, through, you know, it's just going to keep going. 
and uh, build positive reputational benefits over time. Yeah. I want to touch on that, right? So, so especially for people kind of tuning in, like that's, that's not a passive, that's a, that's a, that's an active decision to make it a priority. And I think that's one thing that, that people in organizations need to understand, unless you have this culture of, I'm a big culture of forgiveness over permission. Permission takes so damn long. It's crazy, right? Um, just roll with it. Most things aren't going to break things. And if it does, and it causes a huge organizational problem, then I made a mistake building a business that was fragile, right? Like we need to be able to break things. Um, but that's not something that like a recruiter or somebody involved in that, in that interview process, or even somebody that's referring a friend to set the right expectations. That's something that is not a casual thing to drop in because most people are spending all of that time in that first interview trying to figure out are they worth the company's time right they're like are you good enough to get to the second phase it's a little bit of an ego thing right of like well i'm super busy changing the conversation say what makes you happy what makes you want to get up i'm sure it's a very different thing what happens if they don't know how to answer it i wouldn't be surprised one since most people aren't asking that like what you know does that happen, Aaron? Does that happen when that trips people up? You guys, you would be surprised. Honestly, you give them a beat to think, just to sit back and think, huh? You know, you'd be you'd be shocked at some of the some of the answers I've got. And some people are very, um, they're a little more, you know, ten thousand foot in their thinking. Others are like, this is important to me. I need to be home by four o'clock to pick up my kids from the bus. But very rarely do people not know. how how to answer that question. And I think it's because they know they have the agency now. And, and to your point, Jeremy, about, you know, getting people in the doors to, you know, to like, to, to make the money to be though, that comes after, like, you are not going to be successful in a business. And in, in my opinion, especially now, if you do not have a band of people behind you who are happy and willing to do the good work, right? The hard work, the tough work, the putting in the extra hours when, when clients need it, you don't have that band of people together. And that can only come from having that similar, similar culture. And what better way to find out if these people share those values, share those beliefs, have that, you know, similar growth mindset than to start it within the first conversation. It's a missed opportunity if you don't. So let's let's step back a little bit because I, I I think this is helpful, right? Have a make a decision. That's that's my, what I'm hearing. It's make a decision. If it's important, do it. Don't don't hope your people adopt a philosophy of being give first and take second. Give them the platform. Talk about what makes you happy. What makes you want to wake up and go to work? Because if and that's the other thing. You know, I'm derailing my own line of thing, but it's like they're gonna know in 20 minutes of the job if it's true or not. That, like, that's the thing for me that blows me away of how I've had a number of friends have the, a little bit of a bait and switch where they're offered a job, then they get a weekend and they're like, this is not what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. And it's astounding to me because it's like, what did you, ex they're waking up at their apartment or their house, they're walking to their laptop, and then they start work, like, they're going to immediately know because there's no way to distract from the truth. There, there is no water cooler chatter where you're popping over to say, hey, how is the weekend? What's going on? Like you're on Slack, you're on Teams, you're on Zoom, you're on your calls, you're with your clients, you're working. There, you yeah. know, and you got kids in the other room that are, that are you know, you, you got the dog barking in the back. You have life happening around you. If the job isn't what you expected it to be, it's very hard to not immediately know that and it's hard to get rid of it, you know, and that's, that's where I'm, I'm curious to see. And I don't have the data on this. So this is for another conversation with another, but I'm curious what the turnover looks like for that exact instance, right? How much of the turnover rate is, is actually driven down because people are no longer patient enough to give the company six to 12 months because they look at it two weeks in. They're like, oh, I didn't sign up for this. Well, that's the, that's the reason why people like Aaron are going to, con they've, they've listened to what that candidate wants in their career path. And Aaron is going to deliver on that. So she's going to keep, you know, following up over the time period with, when that, as, as that candidate grows into the job and make sure that they are still, uh, you know, engaged and continuing to learn new skills and, yeah. you know, really gaining the value, seeing the value of what it's like to be employed by that organization. 
So how do you, so in sprint groups grown from, you know, a couple partners, a couple contractors to what, 60, 50 to 60 people now, I think. Closer to 50. Yeah. So, you know, so, um, now you're at a point where scaling that one-on-one -on -one development, because it's to your point, people and culture is about making sure that, uh, I, had, I had a professor in, in college and, and, uh, I wasn't the best college student. I'll, I'll, I'll own it. Uh, <laughs> But one of the things that, that always stuck with me was the, the, the it was the framework around, uh, you know, green, ha green means go, you have to be able to move the masses, but it's good to know if their favorite color is purple. From a framework of you got to drive the company, something has to be yeah. able to be predictable enough so they know how to show up and execute. But if you don't know what makes them individually move, then yeah, you might move traffic, it might move the masses, but you're going to have a lot of people taking the off ramp. Mm -hmm. So when you get to 30, 40, 50 people, Aaron, like, how do you scale that individual development so that you're accounting for change, right? People yeah. have life events, what we want and need changes. And it's not always volunteered. Let's, you know, yeah. life events happen three months later, you're like, what happened? And their view on work changes. So I think some, some professionals would love some, some insight in a process. How do you scale the, that when you're, you know, somebody said something in interview number one to, to like lose track of it is almost, it's almost painful, right? Cause like, yep. I told you, this is important to me, but 18 months later, we haven't talked about it. How do you approach scaling the one-on-one -on -one training and development? It's, I really, Jeremy, I appreciate the question so much because it's something we are currently going through and it's, it's a challenge, right? Like it, we aren't seven or eight core team members anymore. We are double that. And to your point, we are double the contractors. And I am having conversations with people all the time about how we continue to keep our culture intact now that we're growing into that next level. Um, one thing that has really helped me is we, Insprint does not believe in an annual performance review. Those things drive me crazy. I don't like paper. I don't like any of that. What I do instead is I encourage all of our core team members. Um, we have a process where they tell me what, what kind of feedback they want. I put it in a simple survey. I send them the link. They distribute it to their teams, which ends up touching most people. And we, um, we get feedback. We do that quarterly. Now, that is not to say that quarterly uh, is the right answer for getting feedback. We all know feedback is timely, right? And I know people cringe at like, the, oh, getting feedback, delivering feedback. But the only way you're going to be able to successfully scale and to successfully know and understand what your people want is if you talk to them. Also, even more importantly, if you listen to them. So I have a pulse on my core team. My core team has a pulse on the teams that they are working with. And we just wrapped up Q1 conversations where I have already implemented feedback that I have heard you know, yeah, maybe secondhand, but still that doesn't matter. And it's had a lot to do with this growth piece. So, you know, people can, like I said, they can send their links, they can, you know, make sure they're checking in, but people know that's the only way you establish an environment. Like people can say all the time, my door's open, come talk to me, tell me anything. But by putting these quarterly touch points on, that's one way that I can help establish that. Um, and I hope that the message continues to say, come talk to me anytime. You have feedback for me. You think we can do this better. You feel a little slated over here. Something's changed with you. Just come talk to us about it. Um, so that feedback piece, like get rid, of, get rid of the annual performance review. Nobody likes it. It's so dated. Nobody wants that. And just make sure that you really do cultivate that culture of people being able to talk to you at any time they want about anything they want. And the, the only other thing I'll say to that is that if you can be the gateway to as your people and culture lead to your partners, to your CEO, to your C-suite, even better. Meg is so open about having people schedule time on her calendar and she's, she means it, you know, um, people want to hear from leaders. And the, one of the, one of the things that does distinguish us, and I have heard this from different people from different um, organizations is that they have accessibility to leadership. So if you can, yes, to your people person, but also to your leadership, it will really, really send you into that next level. You know, I think the other thing that is so impressive uh, and, and also shows how public relations and HR in working together, create in, an incredible brand story um, that really will help the organization in, in so many ways. So because Inspirant Group does not do annual reviews, they're constantly talking to employees. And as Erin just said, she just finished first quarter conversations. Well, you've got feedback 
in real time feedback. And so she can respond to what people are, are needing, what they want. Uh, she can make changes. She can pivot in terms of programs that she's planning. But she's also going to contact me and share some of those stories with me um, about the important, how, how the company's core values are blended in to every conversation, how learning and development is so important. That's a big selling point for the organization. I'm going to then, as a PR person, I'm going to then develop, um, maybe it's a, a byline article with the CEOs, uh, you know, as the author to talk about the importance of core values and what, or, you know, what, what core values should be, you know, in today's, in today's uh, world and how, how to make them so resonant that people just, yeah. People are thriving because of it, because you're living, if, if leaders are living their core values, then they're creating a very positive working environment. So I go out, I pitch a byline article, or I, I get the CEO, like Meg, interviewed by a major media outlet. She starts telling this story about the culture. So we're amplifying all of that brand messaging, and that that gets out there and enhances the company's reputation and helps them to attract talent. Yeah. yeah there's a couple things that, that, uh, you know, people that, that tune into the show know I like, I like taking some notes. A um, couple things stood out there. Right. So one is people like to test drive things, right. Whether it's a software product, it's a, it's a, it's an employment opportunity. People like to test drive things. Right. Um, I'm in a number of Facebook groups for, for marketing com execs, and it is not uncommon for people to drop a, they use, they use those communities like people have used search. We're thinking of hiring this vendor. I'm thinking about joining this team. What have you heard? Like they use that to test drive the experience, right? That type of an article can allow you to test drive it. Now, let, you know, depending on relationship, you could put out a lot of content that's like, we have amazing culture, but it, then it doesn't fall through. So there is some staying power to, you can do all of the top of the funnel comms. You still have to deliver on your word, right? That's where Aaron on the interview process and you really own it. But in the talent acquisition process, you have to allow people to test drive it. I put out, I put up a post when we were hiring that literally was like, here's the good about working with us. Here's the bad about working with us. Here's my promise about it. I had a dozen people reach out and say, that was the most honest thing I've read in a while. Like I, uh, and they, I just put my resume in and it literally was not complicated. It, it was, it was, these are the things that are good. And the things that were bad was we're young. We don't have health insurance. We will by this point is the goal. Here's the range. The expectation is this. And like, you know, it was just, it was just in my, it was common sense. It was mm -hmm. just common sense. Transparency. It, a lot of people to test drive it though. The other thing is validation and recognition, not from a standpoint of um, always giving people the pat on the back. It's the, I see you, I hear you, right? I think that's the biggest piece is people want to feel understood and they want to feel heard and they want to feel like they are connected in a sense of belonging to the company. Um, but it's hard to do that if you do it annually. So, so love quarterly, any cadence. Uh, and then that transitions into uh, what, I, what I look at is like, the drivers of today are very different than drivers pre, you know, digit like GPS, right? The, you know, I'll never forget when, uh, you know, you get to print out like a map quest to like hit, hit sales routes and knock on doors, right? Yep. So, you know, you had to plan, you know, a couple miles out, right? Nowadays, if you drive with somebody that's only used a GPS, if they can't see 200 feet down the road, they feel like they're now driving a spaceship and they're leaving the world. Like they're like, I need to know exactly what my next turn is. Um, I think the same thing professionally, right? People want to know 200 feet at a time. Where am I going? When's my off ramp? When, when am I joining? When am I merging? Like they're always used to seeing the journey forward, but in professional development, it's not as clear, right? Um, and that's part of where you need people internally that understand enough about you to know how to guide you in a moral way where it's, it's not manipulative, but it's truly at their advantage while being cognizant of what the company needs, but it's giving people the ability to play 200 feet at a time. You know, um, I was talking to a different client about this in the sense of a, a lot of like, you know, miss, you know, uh, random ideas, like let's do this, this, this around and Julie, I'm sure you get that all the time with clients. Let's do this article, this blog, this video. Right. Um, one of the things we always talk about is like, the, the strategy is not for strategy's sake. It's because back to that driving analogy, you know, if you have all these awesome little ideas, it may play out, but if you go 200 feet at a time, like a, if I'm going from DC where I am now, 
you know, I'm going to end up in Seattle because I went 200 feet at a time drifting instead of hitting San Diego. Like I wanted to, you want to be strategic in your communications because you want everything to link back to it, to, to, to what your business goals are. Um, I, I must say that what, you know, one of the, one of the most underutilized platforms for uh, telling the story about company culture is LinkedIn. And it's a great place for uh, leaders to share real stories about what's happening, what they're observing, the good and the bad um, with, with their followers and with the, with the public about their culture, about challenges they're dealing with employees, with HR issues, whatever it is, with growing their business. Um, you really can develop, you can really attract a lot of different audiences to your organization that way, whether they be, you know, job candidates, investors, uh, members for the board of directors, strategic partners, just by telling your story um, and sharing the things that you're dealing with as a leader on a daily basis. Um, I know, um, I know Erin, Erin has used LinkedIn as a platform to talk about how she works with, you know, employees on learning and development issues and how she's addressing some of the, the challenges um, to, so that she could keep employees in their positions and keep them happy, but keep them growing and provide exciting opportunities for them to continue learning and, and expanding on their skill set. I think there's a huge opportunity right now for, um, it goes back to being heard, seen, and, 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 and recognized in that sense of there is no digital water cooler right now, right? Like LinkedIn is, Twitter is, we'll see if Elon Musk buys it, takes it private, if that changes it. <laughs> um, you know, but, but uh, one of the things I've started looking at, I'd love your, both of your take on this because I think it's something that's been kind of renting space in my, in my brain for a while now is um, we do uh, like a does it serve us type of review as a team where we look at the recurring meetings, the tools and resources, those types of things. And it's, it's not like overblown. It's just, okay, these are the, the five technologies we use to do task management, communications, whatever it is. Does this serve us? Is it distract? Does it enable you to do better? And if, if we have enough majority on no, then we get rid of it. If we like it, we double down, right? Um, same thing with like recurring meetings and things like that that are baked in the schedule. Like, does that meeting on that recurring basis add us, add to the value, add serve us? If it doesn't, get rid of it. Like everything is, is a human being making a decision away from being better, right? Um, so, so let's just do it. Um, but what, what came from that is, is I kind of started realizing that um, most of the communication is nonverbal, no tonality, no body language, right? It's even Zoom is a little bit there, right? Not everyone's a video call, but a lot of email, a lot of chat, a lot of text. Um, when you've never met the people you work with uh, and, and most calm is, is chat-based, you lose a lot of that, that uh, I don't know, that, that special thing, in my opinion, that is what builds a relationship. Right. You can I can text and chat with people all day, but sometimes you get a five minute phone call together. Like I'll have people call and say, hey, like I, I want to give feedback on this piece of creative, but, you know, I don't want to sound like a B or I don't want to sound like an A. Right. Like in that chat, uh, what do I do? And so, you know, we basically I did a survey of everybody uh, that was like, what were the questions, concerns and things you had in the first 90 days and built and treated the employee like a customer. And we built a full content library to support it. Here's how to handle conflict. Here's how to handle this. Here's the tools we use for this. Here's our philosophy on meetings. Here's how we do. The, and it was one of those things where it immediately created some movement, but culture attracting talent there's there's a current moment in place where how we communicate is really important you know you know well i think you know uh aaron can explain i mean inspirant is a, a remote first company right so although they do you do get together uh, and have in-person meetings and events every so often um most people are working remote all the time but right. they yet you they have fostered a really tight-knit community um, and a bond between employees, a high, very high level of collaboration and engagement. Erin, uh, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about how you do that. Yeah, absolutely. Are you guys familiar with the what I the, the golden rule? Treat Unpack. others how you want to yeah. be treated. 
So yes. my favorite thing, and Meg will say this too, there's a new rule in town. It's called the platen rule. Treat others how they want to be treated. And I think Love communication that. is a huge part of that. It takes very little time to reach out, to know and understand. Well, I'll say, I say now very little time as we're still a relatively small organization, but even you can do this during the onboarding pro process. What, how do you most like to be communicated with? Do you like email? Do you like Teams or Slack? Um, you know, the, the chat on what, whatever anyone's using. Do you like a pick up a phone? Do you like a Zoom call? Would you rather meet for a cup of coffee? How are you feeling? Are you comfortable? Um, I think the more that people know and understand, and yeah, it gets to be a lot of folks, but that's what makes you stand out. How others want to be communicated with, it leads you to the most effective, I mean, collaboration, working relationship, but also, I mean, take it past that, right? At Inspiring Group, you will not, you, I mean, we are a family there and I will say that and you might roll your eyes and that's okay, but I truly believe that. And I think it's because, we take the time to get to know each other. Um, and once you really know and understand what your people care about, so whether it's communication, whether it's the fact that they, you know, they need to care for their elderly parent one day a week, whatever that looks like, once you know and understand what they care about, you can really work and adapt your, your style to that, your company to that. That is what, you know, makes the culture what it is. And it opens the door to communication, right? It just makes it that much easier, that much better, that much more transparent. So I, I really think if you just take the time to know and understand how people best communicate, what they, I know that if I really don't want to hear from Meg, I email her and she will be the first person to tell you that I need to call her. I need to text her. Right. So once you know and understand that about people, yeah, you'll, you'll be more effective, but also it only, it helps to build that culture too. So how do you execute on that? I, I couldn't agree more, I, but this is one of those, those, those obstacles and opportunities when it's effective that, you know, uh, we'll call it what it is an outdated executive team. That's like, well, you know, they just need to show up and work. Right. Um, they might look at it. We'll just send out a survey, but it's like, you, you know, yes, sure. But you don't build trust and, and respect and that connectivity because you sent out a survey to your company. No, they, has, will, they will over time, if they continue to do those things that are not high touch, that are, don't really engage with people on a human level. I, I think that they will see attrition. They will see unhappiness and discord and they will see in their work product that there's not that synergy that that fostering human relationships and human connection and yeah. communicating with transparency can do can do yeah it's small things right i'm i'm a big right. fan you know my team's probably like yeah we get it dude but like i'm a big fan of those 5 minute touches like I, I don't think most things need to be like huge, long meetings. Sometimes it can, or, or this is one thing that, you know, again, my take is like, it, it, every time you talk to somebody, it doesn't always have to be about work. Like every single time you call somebody, if you're like, how's that thing coming? What's happening? I'm not saying that shit doesn't have to get done, but call him and just, Hey, I, I'm driving or, Hey, I'm, I just wanted to take a second. We hadn't caught up. I was thinking about you. How are you? Everything good. You need anything from me? Like those little touches that just like makes it. So it's not an input of time and an output of work. It can change everything in my opinion. And it's, but it's no different than how we treat friends. Like if, if a friend called you and every time they called you, they needed something from you at some point, you'd be like, this ain't a good friendship. Right. Yeah. You know, and obviously the work dynamic is a little different, a lot of money in play, a lot of, lot more risk if you want to call it that, but I don't know. There, there's the little touches that need to be scaled out. You know, it's not always the formal survey, the annual performance review. And also people want change at the speed of how they feel. If you're waiting nine months for, you know, why not promote them now, right? Why not give them the raise now? Why not, you know, do whatever you're doing um, just because you're waiting until the year end to see how cash flow is, right? You know, like what, what's the reasoning behind it? I think that's a big piece. So as we look, as we look to kind of tie, tie some things up here in the next five, 10 minutes, I, I'd, I'd love to, to drill deeper into um, how, what's that first step for PR, comms, marketing, and head of people. Like if they go from nothing to something, whether it's, Hey, we want people to be more active on LinkedIn. We want to start to, to understand our people better. What does in, from your, your experience, what does that first step look like to put it in motion as it is now a priority in the company? 
I think I really think that the the first step is first of all is to have to get together, <laughs> to have HR and PR meet together and talk about company core values and make sure that those are very clearly stated. There should not be any more than what, Aaron, three to five core values, yep. because otherwise it will be too hard for people to remember and carry out. Yeah. Um, I know Inspiring Group has three core values and they're constantly being referenced. Um, you know, in casual ways and more formal ways, they're really embedded into the culture. And, right. you know, leaders really walk the talk. I mean, they really are, um, they really are living those core values. So that's the first, that's kind of a foundational thing, having the core values in place. And then we talk about what, what the business objectives are through communication. What do you want to get across about, about the, the organization? Um, and we start building out a strategic communications plan, you know, and, and decide what avenues to take to get those, um, to get that across. We, we discuss and outline key messages. What are the main things that we want to say about this company, about this brand over and over again? Yeah. You know, in Inspirin's case, that it's a caring company, that you care about the greater good that um, you're adding a, more of a human touch to, to management consulting. Um, so it's, you're sort of, you're disruptors in that particular industry. We talk about that a lot. And then we talk about the importance of company culture, yeah. of a caring culture and how that really helps to cultivate talent. So, um, and then my next step would be to identify those, you know, opportunities to get those messages out there, whether it's, you know, media relations work, um, pitching byline articles on some of those topics, yeah. um, tying, you know, or perhaps it's pitching subject matter experts like Aaron, um, like Carrie Maselli, who oversees learning and development, and like Megan Newhouse, this the CEO. Um, we also, though, focus on LinkedIn and, and, and encourage executives to share their stories on LinkedIn about what's happening on a daily basis. Those small stories that really um, showcase the nuances of what it's like to work at Inspiring Group. It's, it's funny you say the small, I, it doesn't always have to be a press release, right? Most times it doesn't. Sometimes it can be a uh, you know, I call them micro blogs, like 50, 25, 45, 60 words. You're just telling a story. Um, one thing I want, I want to pull out uh, from what you just uh, shared, Julie, really, to, to kind of drill at home is identifying values is, 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 is important. You also need to be able to look at those and then I understand how to implement it into an interview process to look for qualities or things that make it so that, I mean, the culture is, um, the way I look at it is like the attributes of the people are the operating system of the business, right? So if you have people that are uh, caring and human centered and people first, and that, that's how they operate outside of work, then you have a good chance of bringing in people that, that fit that value, right? And so I think one of the opportunities, the more I talk to people in recruiting and talent acquisition is, it's not just about like have the values, it's know how to incorporate a line of questioning to learn if the people you're interviewing share in those values. So, you know, one of the things I'm very loud about in our first interview is like, we have five core values that to be honest, if you don't hit them, there's no shot because it just won't work, right? And it's like, it's kind, curious, uh, uh, positive, growth oriented and a, a proactive communicator. You're going to have unlimited PTO. You're going to have all the freedom in the world. So if I got to chase you to learn something, it won't work. I need you to be proactive. If you're not kind and considerate, there's no shot because we're virtual. You have to have a thoughtful bone in your body, right? There's little things. And so when we're talking on the front end of the interview, I want to understand where you're going. And if you share those five values, if I- Well, if you, you ask those kinds of questions, Aaron, don't you? That will kind of bring out- Sure, yeah. From the sounds of it, I'm sure, right? Um I love it. So, so build the plan, understand how to, how to get active. And I also think it's like, take the pressure off, post on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. just post, right? It's not going to transform the business in one post. It's not going to do well, harm in one I post. Will, I will say that it, it can't, you, you, you need to approach your content on LinkedIn with a strategic eye. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just throw anything out there because you want it to be consistent in line with your core values, with your key messages, Right. And what you really want to communicate, it doesn't have to be a lengthy post, but it should have 
the kind of, it should carry a certain amount of value um, and consistency in messaging. Yes, absolutely. And it also doesn't have to take forever. I think one thing I'll, I'll, I'll throw out there just as a two cents to any exec that's like 98% there, the 2% is like, I don't have time. I'll just have somebody write it for me. Yes, you can do that, but you're going to get a lot of value by being a part of the community you're making deposits into, having the qualitative feedback, being a part of the community, seeing what's happening, right? It, you know, little things make a big difference. Well, yeah. I mean, I one of the things I do for executives is I do LinkedIn content strategy and I do uh, develop their content, but it's, it is a highly collaborative process. Um, any, any communications professional who says, oh, I'll just post for you. We don't even have to talk about it. No, that is a red flag. Exactly. You have to really, you have to develop a rapport with the executive or really get into their head and be able to yeah. articulate thoughts and ideas that sound like them. Totally. At, at the least, like I'm a, a we have, we have, uh, we work a lot of private equity and, and financial services. I always feel like they're always on the move. They're running around to different deals. So a lot of our operational relationships is transitioned from like, don't wait, don't wait to send me that email, send me a voice memo. I can then send it, transcribe it, send it to my person that does QA. They'll build a plan and just organize the thoughts if it's long, but it's like, speak it out, talk it out. Like, let me interact with the idea. Um, and I think that can, that can play with content, but it, it just, start have a core understanding of what you're trying to do um let's let's close it out here um aaron anything that's top of mind for you or things that you want to share before we kind of wrap things up julia i'll come to you next and i'll kind of take us home from there yeah, the only the only thing that's coming to my mind is you know we're we're, ta we're talking about the great resignation it's hard to get people it's hard to keep people i just you i my best and biggest advice is just to be genuine to communicate to over communicate if you have to um, and you know, the, I think that the more that you do that and the more that you're true to the, the company that you're working for, um, the spaces you're trying to fill there, the more that you are going to see things work out in your favor and the happier your folks are going to be. So keep at it. It's been hard. I'm not going to say it's been easy. It is not this, even the recruiting process from my standpoint, it is not easy, but, but hang in there because I really do think that this is, it's a new day and um, between people really going after what they want and for companies out there trying to create environments that will attract those types of people, we, we've got a good shot. So it's a new day. Good luck. <laughs> um, and just keep at it. Love it. Julie, your and, thoughts? And, and I'll say that, you know, companies, um, I encourage companies to connect the public relations, marketing, and HR departments, there is a huge opportunity for you to enliven and to tell a, a cohesive brand story when those two areas are working hand in hand. And you're missing an opportunity if that doesn't happen, because that message can really be a key recruitment tool during the great resignation and attracting talent and getting your story, the stories that you want to tell out into the public domain. 100% agree. Couldn't agree more. Uh, most people are not ready to instantly quit their job and start somewhere new. Your ability to create compelling content consistently and sustainably in the places they're spending time is your ability to let them test drive and interact with you, your values, your approach, and the way you do things while they understand more about who they are, what they want, and where they want to be. Um, marketing is very much so in the enablement process today. Not as it's, it's uh, allow people to be well-informed, to make great decisions. Um, and if you're doing those things, you're going to find great people. It's not easy, uh, but, but it's certainly a process to adopt. So, um, Aaron, Julie, thank you guys for, for jumping in, sharing some time. Everybody, uh, appreciate you stopping by and, and spending some time with us. A um, couple of things that I would just leave to take away. Let them test drive what you're doing. People want to know where they stand, but they also want to know you care. They want to be seen, heard. They want a sense of belonging. Um, you got to pay them well. You got to give them benefits and an opportunity to grow. But at the end of the day, they spend more of their time alone than they do at a company office in an environment. They have more time with their thoughts than ever before. If they don't like something, they don't feel it's congruent with that, them, who they are. They can't hide from it anymore. So give it all away and let people come home, so to speak, you know? Um, but that's what we got for today. So thank you guys for stopping into the Marketing Water Cooler podcast. Um, real quick, where can people plug into Instant Group and Want Leverage? Well, Want Leverage, uh, look us up on, well, look look for me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, and my, my website is wantleverage.com. Beautiful.
And then, Aaron, are you putting out content on LinkedIn? Can people follow you there I as well? I am. Come and follow me, Aaron Mohadeen. Uh, and Inspirant Group, through Inspirant Group as well, inspirantgroup.com. So beautiful. Everything will be yeah. tagged in the in the show notes. But everybody, Great. thanks for stopping in. You guys take care. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, we'll be thanks back you guys. More. Bye. Bye.